We are at nine o'clock, so um, I'm going to start out. And so I'm Cindy uh, Hagley from Sea Grant. I'm retired, but I'm still working with Sea Grant. So um, today we have sort of the same cast of characters, and I'm going to share my screen now so that you can follow along with me. One second. All right. I assume you're seeing my slides. So today we're really lucky to talk about winter ecology, but before we get started, I want to tell you that um, I want to do a special call out to a few of the people on our team who you've been introduced to multiple times. One of them is Lori Hawk. Hack or Hawk? No, I can't do it. Is it Hack or Hawk? Somebody unmute. It's Hack. Dang it. Okay. <laughs> So Lori has been unbelievable in terms of the amount of energy she's invested in this and she apologized profusely for having to miss today, which I thought was really unnecessary because we are so appreciative of every minute she's given us. The other person I want to call out is Brenna and Brenna has been our intern all summer. She officially is done with her internship, but she's still here today plugging away with us when she could be out swimming paddleboarding and other things. So um, special shout out to Brenna. If we were all together, we'd applaud her. So if you wanna put your little applause thing up in the um, chat, I think it's a good time to do it. The rest of us, it's the same cast characters. So without further ado, um, uh, we're gonna introduce Kirill in a few minutes. I'm really excited for him to talk. And um, we're gonna ask all of you, as you know, to hold your introductions to each other until we get into the breakout rooms where you'll have a chance to talk a lot. And you always see this slide, but I've modified it a little bit. So we always tell you you're part of the Center for Great Lakes Literacy, but I also wanna tell you to remember to go to the homepage there and I've got it marked in red. You can sign up to get email updates. So you'll know immediately when it's time to apply for the Guardian or anything else that you know is going on in Wisconsin and Minnesota although you'll still be on our other lists as well for our two states. But, and then also that there's a really strong and robust curriculum search tool um, within the Center for Great Lakes Literacy website. So please be sure and do a little bit more digging on there. There's webinars about the basics of the Great Lakes and a bunch of other stuff. Thanks for that. And then um, remember that we'll be recording all these sessions and um, the chat content, although when you're in your breakout rooms, the chat does not automatically get recorded. So I think you also have heard that drill. Take those chat pieces and share them in another way, either in your notes or in the, the notes that you record online or back in the main chat so that we get them on paper. Um, let's see. The other thing I wanted to mention is that if you um, remember next week at, for our joyful hour, we really welcome you to have given tons of thought to your action plan by then and have it with you. Because I think we'll spend at least a good share of the joyful hour talking about action plans, looking for, you know, if you've got something you wanna share and see if other people are interested in it too, um, it would be a really good time to bring it and be ready to, to reflect on it a little bit. And please, um, even if you didn't sign up officially for Joyful Hour next week, please, if you want to come, just send, um, send Anne, I believe, an email, Anne, you can correct me if I'm wrong in a minute, and um, we'll add you back in because I think it could be a really robust chance for us to all to talk together. And don't forget that we've got your participant file chock full of resources for you that um, we encourage you to look at whenever you have a chance. And I know you're all probably really busy with getting ready for school right now. So I think, um, unless I've forgotten something, let's see what's coming next. Um, we are ready for our poll question. And I think I turn it back over to Anne for that. Is that right, Anne? And I just wanna say that um, this, this is Cole's set of questions and I think it's brilliant. So go for it. Everybody go ahead and click on the poll. No clicking. Is everyone seeing oh, it? Because it says it's launched. It says it's launched and there are zero. Oh, here we go. Warming up to it. I guess they were kind of, it took a while to read all those. They're all laughing because it was so punny. Yeah, it is very punny. 
Kirill, what do you think? You like those questions? You're, you're muted, so you don't have to say anything. All right, how many people have we gotten? 19. So um, Cole, are you gonna tell us the right answer? <laughs> the right answer depends on your frame of mind. <laughs> All right, I think, I think we have a pretty good idea that people like the Christmas quarrels and the herring rumors. Well, no, I guess it's kind of coming on pretty even. So um, I think that'll do. And thank you everybody for participating. And now remember to hit the stop sharing button. And uh, I'm looking at the time. What time do we have? So I think what we'll do now is um, even a little bit early. I think we're done sharing the results and you can turn that off. Um, and uh, remember that we're here if you have questions. And I'd like to, at this point, Kirill, I'd like to introduce you. So Kirill worked with us yesterday to say his last name correctly. And so let me try. Um, Kirill um, Shapov. How'd I do? You did well. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I have known Kirill for about a year because he and I judged the science fair together. And at that time, I, we talked about his science and I said, I need to get you involved in outreach and education. And he said, okay, I'm game. And so here he is and we're really excited to have him. So I'm gonna let Kirill take it from here. You've all probably seen his bio and uh, I'm very excited to hear what you have to say, Kirill. Thank you. And I'm going to do the stuff I have to do, which may take me forever because I'm really slow at this. Okay, stop share. So I think we're on to you, Kirill. All right. So uh, let me share the screen with everyone. And all right. Wait, just a second, sorry. Screen desk two. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can, Kirill. How about now? Good? All right. Um, hi, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about lakes in winter. And my outline is going to be I will start with the importance of winter, why it's important, why we study winter, what's interesting in that. And then I will move to methods that we uh, used uh, in our uh, projects and uh, show you some pictures and cool video. Uh, then I will move to the our project. I will just describe what what I've done, what we uh, what we did in winter, and uh, then I will move to some of the results of our projects and uh, some other um, important results from other researchers. And I will try to answer a question, what do we know about lakes in winter? And I will move forward to open question, to big questions that still remains in winter limnology. All right, um, let's start with the importance of winter research. Okay, if you look at this slide, you will find one common thing that's kind of, it's a lot of information on different kind of parameters, but one thing is missing, right? If you look at this, you will find that we're missing winter and because winter understudied. So nobody, it's like few research happen in the winter time. And I will try to explain why. Why, if you look at the uh, graphical representation of our year from January to December, most of the limnological research and field work happened in summer. So like it's from May to September. And we, if we're lucky, we can extend those, that uh, uh, field uh, work from March to October. But most of the time, you know, it's just between May and September. And uh, even we are lucky and we extended our field work, we are still missing three months. And if we didn't sample lakes in March, April, late, uh, uh, late spring and like uh, uh, late uh, fall, we have like seven months. So it's, we're missing between three to six months to seven months of information. It's more than half of a year. So uh, it's like reading a book, right? It's just half of a book you didn't read. You just start somewhere in the middle or in the end. You don't know the whole picture. So, and that's because of uh, many reasons. First of all, uh, winter is skipped because it's logistically difficult. If you're uh, working in the winter, it's hard to get 
um, on the lake. Um, if it's small lake, it's okay. But if it's lake like Lake Superior and it's open, it's really hard to get on the middle of the lake. And uh, another reason is uh, because of most of the uh, people who work, uh, uh, who study lakes, they are teaching during the, those months and they are just not available for field work. And another reason uh, also, uh, it's the equipment. It's, first of all, it's expensive and it should um, withstand that cold weather, harsh conditions. It's, uh, uh, sometimes it's, you have difficulties right on the field with the equipment. And that's why um, many years winter was skipped and many researchers, many scientists were uh, assumed that winter is a dormant period. So it's nothing happened. It's like zero activities under the ice. Okay. We will start now with the uh, big picture. We will start with the climate change. We know that the air temperature is increasing uh, slowly and it's supported by uh, many agencies. A lot of uh, weather stations show it. Uh, all of these records that we have showing that air temperature is increasing. And along with the air temperature, we know that lakes around the world are warming up as well. And here on this graph, uh, on this map, map you can see the red dots and blue dots. Those are the lakes. The red dots represent lakes that warmed up uh, from 1985 to, to 2009, and the blue dots representing uh, cooling down uh, lakes. If you notice that most of the lakes on this map are warming up. So, and also those lakes that you see here, most of those lakes located in the Northern Hemisphere. That means they will experience uh, ice cover and yes most of the lakes actually we find we will find in the northern hemisphere and those lakes will have ice cover during the winter and what's happened uh, if the air temperature will keep rising what's happened with ice we uh, and what's happened under the ice we actually don't know we do know that for example great lakes uh, they are also warming up and losing ice here we have on this graph Right on the bottom, we have a uh, percent ice cover, and that's the long-term data from 1973 to 2019. You can see that uh, we have downward trend of uh, disappearance of ice. So ice is slowly disappearing from the Great Lakes. And it's not only Great Lakes around um, the globe. Other lakes are uh, slowly warming up and uh, missing ice. And, uh, in the, and here on this uh, picture, we have lakes around the globe and currently uh, based on the research from Sharma et al. in 2019, she found that currently we have more than 14,000 lakes that already experiencing intermittent ice. And with increase of air temperature projected increase, uh, if it's gonna be two Celsius degree increase of air temperature, we will have um, around 35,000 uh, lakes without ice or experiencing intermittent ice. And if the temperature will rise to eight degree, it will give us more than 200 lakes uh, without ice. And it can impact a lot of people, uh, approximately between 300 to 600 million people around the globe. So important to know for us what's, what's happening in the future. Although we know that the ice disappears and uh, winter conditions are changing, we still do not entirely aware of what's happening in the winter what kind of biological, physical, and chemical processes uh, going on and what's gonna happen if the ice will disappear. Uh, and further, I will um, provide some of the results and other researchers' uh, results and findings uh, on, lake, on lakes in winter time. And first, I will start with our project. Uh, the first project was um, um, funded by Sea Grant, thanks to Sea Grant. Uh, we study Lake Superior in uh, uh, through the year, it was seasonal study. We sampled uh, Western Arm of Lake Superior. We picked five stations. We sampled those five stations every month with uh, emphasis on winter. Uh, among, among those uh, five stations, we have um, two stations with, without ice and three stations with ice during the winter. Uh, another project was uh, um, we sampled Minnesota lakes, around 13, yeah, 13 Minnesota, uh, Minnesota uh, lakes. We sampled them in uh, winter and compared them uh, to summer conditions. So we also sampled them in summer. And uh, the goal was of this project to look at the zooplankton community, how zooplankton community changing. 
And uh, what methods did we use? How we approached the winter? Here on the picture, right on the left picture, we have a small lakes. It's one of the Minnesota lakes. If you have ice on that lake, you can just walk on the middle. You can use it, different kind of tools. You can measure lights, you can collect water, and um, you can collect zooplankton right from the ice. And on the right graph here on the picture, we have a boat. It's uh, winter time, Lake Superior, it's the Makwait station. We don't have ice, so we use small inflatable boat. And I will show you how, uh, how we work, how we launch that boat. So um, here's another picture of me on the left. I'm collecting water and Later, I will use that water in the lab and analyze for different uh, chemical uh, elements, uh, nutrients that are important to study. And on the right here, I have uh, uh, me collecting zooplankton. And uh, the zooplankton, small crustacean in the water, it's one of the things that uh, I'm interested in. And um, that thing you can actually apply uh, in your classroom with your students, you can use this. A slide actually here. I'm not going to delve in that uh, in the, into details here, but you can use this slide uh, uh, for future uh, with your students. I have a uh, uh, description how to calculate total density of zooplankton um, and all of the notes also uh, here in this slide uh, will, be accept, uh, will be available for you, uh, but I'm not going to hang on this slide uh, a lot. And uh, here is the uh, one of the videos that I want to share with you, uh, just show you how it looks like to collect uh, samples on Lake Superior in the winter time. So we are, uh, we're, that's the station that located in Makwaid, uh, Makwaid Harbor. It's a small harbor, not so far from Duluth, like 10 minutes uh, up north. And you can see that the open, the lake is open completely. We have this entrance to the to the water and we have our small boat with all of the equipments there you can see that the uh, people still fishing from the ice it's uh, actually february 14th 2018 so the looks kind of challenging but at the same time it's quite cool so that's my methods and now we can move to some results i will start first with the light because light is essential for uh, phytoplankton growth right for algae production and in the winter, when the day is short, we, um, the, the under ice can be really dark. So which can potentially reduce the um, production, phytoplankton production. And uh, water light conditions or the light uh, conditions in the lake depends on ice and snow cover. If you have a clear ice, like here on the picture on the left, you can see that that ice is quite clear, right? The bottom of the picture, that's the ice and the top is uh, the water. You can see that uh, we, we call it Sega disc and Sega disc uh, used to measure water transparency in order to figure out how clear your water is. So how, how far you can see that Sega disc in the water that gives you idea how transparent your uh, lake. And you can see, right, without any bubbles, uh, I mean, some thing there, but it's quite clear and uh, it's, not, it's not the obstacle for the light. Uh, when you have snow, that's when you really have uh, uh, deteriorated light conditions under, the, under that snow and ice. Uh, and here is the graph like, representing that. We have um, light intensity right here on the bottom. It's dark, it's bright here. And uh, on the y, on the x axis, we have snow depth. And you can see that with the increase, with the increase of snow depth, our light conditions are getting worse. So less light with the more snow. And um, that actually, um, you can see from this graph, uh, from our results. Uh, so here we have uh, Madeline station, and I will just compare uh, winter 2017 and winter 2018. You can see that in March, uh, we have March uh, data point in uh, 2017 and 2018. We have depth on y-axis. So basically the zero means that's the surface of the ice and you go down to the, uh, to the bottom, right? To the, uh, to the six meters below the ice here. And the yellow line here represent light intensity. So that line, that line basically give you idea how much light you have beneath the ice. 
So for example, here for uh, 2017, we have a lot of light. It's plenty of light for phytoplankton growth. It's just, it's, it's really a lot of light. We also have second disk, ice thickness information uh, for this date and snow. We, you can notice here that we don't have snow in 2017, but if you look at 2018, we have just 10 centimeters of snow, five inches of, four inches of snow. And uh, that completely changed the picture, right? Compared to 2017 and 2018, we almost don't have light beneath the ice. And here's the two pictures that kind of representing it. How clear ice on the left in 2017, no snow. And what's happened in 2018, which is, it's, you, you don't see any ice, just small patch over here. So light is important. Light is important for producers, for phytoplankton. And here I will, before I will start talk about phytoplankton, I will just tell you where I came from. And uh, it's kind of related to what I want to show you. So I came from uh, 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 Siberia, uh, the region around that I used to grow up. Uh, it's around Lake Baikal and Lake Baikal, the oldest lake uh, in the world and the deepest lake in the world. Also cold like Lake Superior, remind me Lake Superior really remind me of Lake Baikal. It's clear and cold lake and it has ice cover to the winter, uh, like its entire lake is freeze over. And uh, here I am on that uh, ice. Uh, it's actually was quite cold there. And what interesting here, it's not me on the snow here on the ice, it's what uh, beneath that ice. And beneath that ice, during the winter, you can find a lot of phytoplankton, like clouds of them. So it's, a, it's called algae bloom. And that algae bloom can produce uh, more than 50% of primary production for that clean lake. So in the winter time, so it's, uh, that means that under ice, we still have uh, algae production and you can see how bright it is too. So what about, so we know about Lake Baikal, what about Minnesota lakes? Uh, the small lakes that we sampled here um, on the left, right? And we have chlorophyll. We measure chlorophyll in order to figure out phytoplankton biomass. So uh, like how many, how much phytoplankton we have there. All of those dots represent uh, one individual lake that we sample in winter, that's the blue, and in the summer, that's the red. Overall, you can see that uh, between winter and summer, we found that chlorophyll is a less, the less phytoplankton in winter than in summer. Same results for uh, another researchers. Uh, so also in winter, less chlorophyll compared to summer. And actually, uh, one thing that this, uh, the Hampton et al. found when they were studying uh, many lakes uh, around the globe, they found that the productive lakes in summer also productive in uh, winter. So some of them, those lakes on the top here, right, they are uh, also have a lot of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is based of food web. And it's supposed, uh, it's basically, it's supporting other organisms, higher trophic levels. And um, when there is a lot of food, that doesn't, it doesn't mean it's uh, always nutritious uh, food, right? So we have a debate between like quantity and quality. So that probably good that we have a lot of phytoplankton, but is it good enough for uh, other organisms? So how we can figure it out? We can measure quality by looking at fatty acids content and the fatty acids, uh, uh, they are energy molecules and specific classes of fatty acids can contain more energy than other classes. So high quality food with essential fatty acids can be important for higher trophic level organisms, especially in the winter. And in the article uh, by Crossboy, um, at all 2017, they look at the fatty acids content in phytoplankton and they found that alga community tend to accumulate those fatty acids, th those energy molecules right before winter, right before ice cover. So you see this peak here, uh, it's probably important for high trophic uh, levels like zooplankton. And since we start talking about zooplankton, we can move to another section here and talk about zooplankton and what's happened with the zooplankton. Um, after producers, we have primary consumers. And uh, here on the graph, uh, we have a zooplankton sample from Lake Minnetonka. Um, one thing that you can notice right away, uh, it's, uh, zooplankton is present under the ice in that lake. And that lake, I wanna mention that it's a productive lake. 
So it has a lot of phytoplankton in winter and summer. And one thing that kind of striked us when we look at the, uh, at the sample, we found uh, that species in general has those uh, species of zooplankton with eggs. So they carrying uh, babies, basically they are preparing to reproduce and it's happened right under the ice. And the second thing we found that Daphnia species also active under the ice and has eggs. Keep in mind that I will talk about the Daphnia a little bit more uh, in the next few slides. All right, so zooplankton is active. Let's look at uh, Minnesota lakes. Uh, let's look at our 13 lakes around the Minnesota. Total zooplankton density showed us that um, an average of the lakes uh, has less zooplankton um, in water than uh, in summer compared to summer uh, time. And if you, you also can use the total zooplankton and, sp uh, and separate them by main groups. Here we have colonoid, cyclopoid, and cladocerans. Um, one thing that kind of interesting um, for me here, that cladocerans, um, they are higher in, in summer, uh, density of cladocerans higher in summer compared to winter. But the, in the previous picture, you saw that we found Daphnia species. It's interesting, right? Uh, okay, so that's uh, Minnesota lakes. What about big lake like Lake Superior? For Madeline Island Station of Lake Superior, uh, we found that in general, uh, summer zooplankton density is much higher than in winter, but we still have some zooplankton. All right, so we have that zooplankton, but how zooplankton survive in, in harsh winter conditions without enough food? Again, uh, moving back to quantity and quality. One suggestion uh, that uh, came from Grossboy, um, uh, some species can um, use different strategies. For example, we have here on the top two species that were able to survive through the winter by accumulating uh, those fats, those uh, fatty acids. So you can see that those, those two species um, were able to get those fats right before uh, winter and survive through uh, the ice cover, right? Those two species on the top, but two species on the bottom, especially that one, uh, the third from the top, uh, disappeared through the winter. And the bottom one, mystery species, uh, they are uh, kind of also disappeared in, and appears only in springtime. That species actually is Daphnia. That's interesting because you remember uh, that we found that Daphnia in the Minnetonka Lake during the winter. And that's just raising a question, how the Daphnia survive? Because the Daphnia likes warm waters and from the, uh, from the many researchers from our results, uh, you can, if you look at the results of different kind of researchers, you will find that Daphnia will not, is not present during the winter because Daphnia is not able to accumulate those fatty acids. So, Apparently, the Daphnia that we found in our samples from small lakes somehow managed to use that strategy uh, to accumulate uh, accumulation fatty acids and survive through the winter. So it's an interesting question how that mechanism, how the Daphnia adapt uh, that kind of for future future research here. And uh, base, uh, actually, let's move to the open question, the big questions in winter limnology. Uh, before, I just want to say that we found that light is available under the ice, that many lakes has, uh, have a phytoplankton beneath the ice, and uh, zooplankton can graze and even uh, use that phytoplankton uh, as a food in winter time. So winter is active, it's not so dormant. And the big questions that has to be addressed in the future, it's what do fish do in the winter, because we don't know. Uh, what controls under ice primary productivity rates within and among lakes? The second question, how do interseasonal connection works? How winter is affecting spring and summer and how summer and fall affecting winter? We don't know. We need to look at this. And what does the disappearance of ice, the main question I think for us, what does the disappearance of uh, winter ice mean for all of the above? Uh, and on this, uh, I will finish. Thank you so much. And please, any questions uh, you can ask. Thank you.
Real thank you. That was wonderful. And um, we have a bunch of questions in the chat. If you have one, please add it. And I'm going to turn it over to Marty. But I just want to say that Kirill is currently working on completing a few papers and finishing his thesis. So wish him the best of luck because right now he's stuck in his office working on stuff. And so let's turn it over to you, Marty, and, and have some questions for about 10 minutes. OK, great. Um, so thanks, Kirill, for that really awesome presentation. I was excited to hear it. And it just sounds like a really interesting, um, I guess, window that you're working in, because it's novel compared to a lot of the research that's going on out there. So um, a, cu a couple of questions that are coming in. Um, I think I'm going to start at the bottom and sort of work my way up. So Brian asks, are you observing high rates of phytoplankton, diatoms, and algae death in the winter to potentially cause dead zones from oxygen consumption due to bacteria decomposition of the phytoplankton. Like, yeah, like like eerie experiencing that. No, no, no. All right, uh, yeah, uh, actually, um, we didn't measure the, the uh, phytoplankton death, so you need like sediment traps and everything. But in general, small lakes especially will uh, have uh, uh, low oxygen conditions. So it's not just it's not just phytoplankton, it's just the winter itself. It's basically you put the cork, the ice cork, on the top of the lake and uh, animals use that oxygen. And phytoplankton, if you have a bloom of phytoplankton, it also will uh, speed up that process, right? It will use, it will actually, when it start decomposing, it of course it will use the oxygen. Uh, many lakes has uh, 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 oxygen depletion that can lead to uh, fish that um, like uh, in really productive lakes. Yeah, but we we didn't see that. We didn't see um, uh, or we didn't even record that information. So um, I, I guess yes, but the primary production is not so high even like in summer it can happen. Um, but yeah, like exception here, uh, Lake Erie, but the Lake Erie, yeah, it's quite productive. I'm not sure if it's the if the oxygen completely goes to zero percent through the water. I'm not sure. Probably at the bottom, really at the bottom. Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, interesting to look at this. Well, thanks for the answer too. Hopefully, um, I answered that. <laughs> well, if there's so much a stuff that I don't know, you just don't don't even imagine. <laughs> if there's a clarifying question. Um, it can be added to the to the chat and we can uh -huh. address it. So let's see, Carly asks, what are some of the hypotheses about what fish do in the winter on smaller ice covered lakes? Mm -hmm. uh, in small lakes, um, if uh, the fish, one of the hypotheses, it can move from deep, like uh, deep parts of the lakes to the uh, uh, literal re literal zone, so near shore, when they can consume other, if they don't have enough food, for example, like zooplankton disappear uh, through the winter, right? Or it's not enough, or it's small some, small size zooplankton that fish can see. Uh, the fish can move to the near shore area when it can consume uh, like periphyton, the thing that grows on the, um, on the rocks or my, microphytes or any invertebrates that live near shore. So one of the hypotheses is that fish can migrate, right? It can move around and look for food. Uh, in small lakes, uh, it's in small lakes, actually, I don't know. I'm, I know that in Lake Superior, uh, fish, the pelagic fish, the deep water fish moves to the shore, shore area near the shore and start feeding on other things like uh, benthic communities. And I didn't talk about benthos here, but that's another important part of the food web uh, of trophic pyramid that um, has to be included in this uh, research as well. So right, so another aspect, another opportunity for study. It's, it's another compartment that missing a lot of attention too. So it's also like a really big chunk of the uh, food in the, in the in the in the lake ecosystem for for fish. Mm -hmm. Leah asks, 
With less and less ice, is there a concern that there will be a profusion of phytoplankton as those numbers won't go down in the winter? Uh, so if less ice, that means uh, more uh, phytoplankton, that's what you're trying to say, ask me, right? So with less and less ice, there may be more and more phytoplankton that are present? Another thing, um, so we have just, we measure chlorophyll here, right? So let's start from, from this. The chlorophyll is just measuring biomass, potential biomass of phytoplankton, but it's not always only phytoplankton, right? We actually don't know what type of phytoplankton in that sample. If that, that's really cool um, thing and really cool uh, question because uh, we, didn't, we don't know the species composition of phytoplankton and some of them will, uh, will be fine when the ice disappear. Like those algae that um, can grow with the light, you know, they don't have to be, um, it, it, will, it will just um, increase those algae, those type of algae, they will, uh, production of those algae will be higher. Uh, it will affect definitely the algae composition. We will have more uh, fast growing algae or like, like green algae, like, uh, um, you know, cyanobacteria, for example. It's just will, if we, we have less size, the water will become much faster, uh, uh, warmer, like it will get warm really fast and it will uh, potentially uh, promote those fast growing algae and warm, uh, warm water loving algae. And that's not so nutritious, that just, you know, grow much faster and cover everything around. Uh, yeah, so uh, potentially the algae production will increase overall if you look through the year, if the ice disappear. For example, right. yeah, it's just like the lake is, will be warmer, right? Um, it will lose the ice and it will faster start warming up. It will, will have more algae that are not um, eatable by zooplankton. The zooplankton will picking different algae that nutritious for them, but the algae that growing and uh, not so juicy, they will just produce in a huge amount. Yeah. So the loss of winter and the loss of ice really has the potential to change how energy transfers in a system. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to say actually here. Uh, the quality again, the quality of the food will uh, decrease. Um, and the quantity of uh, algae with less nutri nutritious food will, will increase uh, potentially. That's because so like, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, the species of phytoplankton can adapt differently to the seasons, right? And when you have like succession of phytoplankton, it's also important when ice disappeared. So when ice disappeared, the algae that were growing under the ice, um, they will... Um, they will be consumed by zooplankton, right? And the remains of that, the remains of the other species will be in the clear phase. That's what so-called zooplankton will eat that uh, phytoplankton. And we will have species that left there of phytoplankton that will grow further to, to the, through the summer, basically. Yeah, but if the ice is- So interesting how everything, so interesting how everything just sort of uh, snowballs. Snowballs, yeah. that was a little, yeah, that was funny. Everything, everything is, yeah. Everything is uh, uh, connected. And that's the, uh, one of the important thing in the winter analogy, how this stuff connected, how, it will how it's affecting each other, right? It's not just we know what's happening in the winter, but how it will link to the future, like months, to the future seasons, like to the trans transition. So another question that came in early on, you mentioned that you grew up um, near Lake Baikal or mm -hmm. on, on Lake Baikal. And Brian asks if you've done any research on that big lake. Yeah, I participate in, uh, I was uh, part of the group, uh, a part of the family, what's, what's we call there. Uh, it's basically a people who, a research institute who monitor the Lake Baikal every 10 days, like since 1940, let me be correct, probably 19, 47, something like that, if I'm not so wrong, but it's a huge long term data for a big lake like Lake uh, Baikal. And I was a student there. I started working when I was 18. 
uh, I was a, a student who worked in the lab like a few hours. Uh, and after I, yeah, I work on that station and also I participate in one big project uh, that, um, that it was a Russian, uh, United States, Russia project in Lake Baikal diversity. It was a big group of people from the United States and I was a, a student there who helped them and like worked with them as well along together. We looked at Lake Baikal biodiversity and microbials of plants and chemical conditions. Yeah. I spent a lot of time working there probably around six years, seven years. Did you get a chance to delve into the data at all? And did you see any long-term trends that are um, interesting? Uh, in Lake Baikal, for example? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's interesting, right? We, we're talking about disappearance of ice, but no one, I, like another aspect that you can look at, the thickness of ice. So the Lake Baikal is still, uh, freezing over every year, but the ice thickness that can reach to almost uh, three feet, it's decreasing, it's getting thinner. Mm -hmm. And the season also shifted. So it's now, the, uh, the ice is now um, on, not in December, like used to be in the end of December. Now it's in January, somewhere in the middle. And the disappearance of ice actually started uh, earlier so it's not just the decreasing of the ice period, but also the ice is itself uh, shrinking. So it's kind of shrinking from bo both dimensions. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Lake Baikal is diverse, uh, really a diverse lake. It's, uh, it has a lot of um, species that um, endemics of that lake, and they're really sensitive to the temperature. And if Lake Baikal, it's, it's good that it's deep, right? because uh, it's a one mile deep, they can migrate to the cold water. But that uh, warm layer beca became much uh, wider. So it's moving down, it's increasing. The, the lake itself is warming. So in that diversity can potentially, uh, it's a trap for that diversity, the air temperature, the, the water temperature increase and the ice disappearance. So it's the, yeah, it's uh, some of the, some of the results are showing that uh, a lot of change is happening right now. But how, yeah. will, how it will, how it, what, what's gonna happen in the future, unfortunately, it's, like, it's hard to say. The lake is huge. It's, it's contained uh, the same amount of water as uh, all the Great Lakes together. So it's a huge system that should be well studied. Right. Well, Kirill, I just want to take another minute to thank you again for answering yeah. questions and for your presentation. I thought it was just terrific. And we do now need to transition to um, the next portion of our workshop. And so I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Cole, I think, to, I, to run the, um, or I forget, is there a break now? There's no, either a no. break or we're turning it over I'm to gonna, Cole. I'm going to turn it over to Cole, but I just wanted to remind people, if you have another question, add it in, and um, Kirill will take a look and try to answer the ones that weren't answered um, when he has time, although he is going backpacking, I believe. Yes. And so it will be several days down the road before he has time to do that. So thank you so much, Kirill, and now let's turn it over to Cole. I just want to say that, sorry, oh. just quick, quick note. Thank you for inviting me, and um, I hope the presentation was good. Thank you the uh, you guys you did really good stuff thanks thanks just want to say thanks hope you enjoy well thank you i think everybody will enjoy um being able to use this material that you presented in their classrooms and um that's a great segue for me because kirill has very graciously allowed us to use a portion of the data he collected to create this activity for you folks so i'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint here to talk about what we've got in store for you. Oops, too far. So as I mentioned, um, we have a data analysis activity for you um, with data provided by Kirill. Um, so I've gone through and taken that information and tried to break it up into um, a format that would be user friendly to a wide variety of uh, learner ages, which posed some logistical struggles for me. And so what I wanna just break this down to you as um, 
kind of like a presentation of what's out there and then we'll uh, see how much time we have to take questions. So with this data, I expect that you'll be able to um, lead your learners through discussions where they assess and compare ecological conditions in three different Minnesota lakes. There's actually four sets of data because Krill has provided us with two different inland lake locations and then two different locations on Lake Superior. Um, with that data, you can compare conditions in the summer versus the winter. And there's different variables, which include depth, temperature, ice coverage, uh, light transmission, chlorophyll A biomass, and um, information on zooplankton populations. Um, so objectives for um, using this with your learners is that you can get them to discuss how the data was collected and why, and use scientific terms. Uh, older learners, you can lead them through uh, exercises where they might make hypotheses about what the data might show before they analyze it. And then they can sort and graph data and depending on their age level, potentially apply some basic methods of statistical analysis, doing things like identifying independent and dependent variables, drawing conclusions about which variables impact chlorophyll A, biomass, and zooplankton populations. Um, we also have some um, exercises where we encourage uh, your, your learners to go out and investigate other research that might support or challenge the conclusions they draw from the data. Um, and then it's important too that they use this exercise as a way to like see how important the data is in helping to answer scientific questions. So being able to make statements about how one variable affects another, affects another, and so on. And then um, also there's ways that you could potentially introduce how human activities are impacted and how um, things like climate change, as Kirill was mentioning in his presentation, as um, we experience warmer air temperatures, um, less and less lakes are having as much ice coverage over time. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do with this. Uh, to help you um, get a grip on the information, um, this is some of the material that's available. We've got a map of the locations he's provided us data for. We've got some additional facts and background information that will help you and your learners understand um, some of the terminology and um, some of the scientific process. Um, there's helpful links. Um, Data sets are provided. Um, I've got two different formats. Some are in like an Excel worksheet format and those you can manipulate. Um, I also have some provided in PDF format. So if you just wanted to print out like a list of the data and have uh, students then figure out how to enter it into an Excel spreadsheet or have them practice organizing it themselves. So you've got some options. Uh, we've identified some key vocabulary terms which could be useful to go over with your learners. Um, and then there's the actual activities themselves. I've broken them down by what I feel is like a beginner level, an intermediate level, an advanced level. So you can decide based on the ages that you teach which level of materials would probably be appropriate or you can pick and choose uh, and go through them all and decide what you want to use from each different set. And then finally, as Kirill indicated in his PowerPoint, there was a section where he had a slide about how they calculate zooplankton density. We have an exercise which goes through the steps that he's outlined in that slide. And I've provided some um, made up or hypothetical data, which um, I kind of back calculated so that it is similar to some of the data that he provided. But in this way, your learners, if they have at least, I would say like um, uh, advanced algebra, math background, they should be able to do these calculations and actually see how what we collect 
is um, mathematically calculated into something meaningful. So um, in our short time, that's about all I can say about it right now, but hopefully you'll find that an exciting option for your students. So where are you going to find this information? Um, it's all in the Google participant folder under this week's session. So this would be the August 12th Winter Lake Ecology. And then um, we have the format, which is pretty standard week to week. You'll need to go into the classroom section, and that's where I've loaded all your activity materials. Um, within the activity itself, there are subfolders, um, including things like other resources. We have our read first file, which has all the instructions and the overview of how everything is laid out. And then we've got the file that actually contains the data and then the file that has those instructions based on learner level. Um, so looking a little bit closer at the learner levels, you've got advanced, beginning and intermediate, and then you've got these two options for the math exercise and math instructions. And I've just provided here on the right side of, oops, I'm trying to move uh, this uh, window here with everybody's pictures out of my way, sorry. So over here on the right side of the screen, I just have a few snippets of what you can expect to find. So we've got prompts that lead you through exercises to do with your students. Um, here's a sample where you have learners compare the data from a combined graph for temperature and depth for two sites for summer and winter and then interpret the graphs focusing on similarities and differences between summer and winter. And then I've got a variety of questions that you could ask to help students synthesize that information. Um, so that's just an example of how these are laid out. Um, and even though I've provided like the three levels, as I mentioned before, hopefully you can pick through and take things that you find is appropriate to your age learner. Um, we've got every age from like fourth grade through high school, so um, it was a bit of a challenge, but I think it worked out. Um, here's an example of how we've got the data arranged in an Excel spreadsheet. And so I've broken it down by site, and um, this one here is for Pike Lake, and it's showing you um, light, chlorophyll A, temperature, and then it's got it broken down by summer, winter. And then there is also a set of data for the zooplankton population. So I don't have a sample showing here, but it is in the file. Here's a sample of some of the graphs. We provide a few graphs for you as a starting point, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't potentially have your learners um, arrange different things in order to work with the different variables. Um, so this would just kind of be a very basic starting spot where we're comparing uh, the temperature at the different depths. Um, and then we've got two inland lakes here. And then this is an example of the math section that we were talking about. So when you look at Curl's PowerPoint um, and then look at our math worksheet, you have to um, kind of understand the process of how this data is collected. So you might remember in his um, PowerPoint, he showed that he had that big kind of like cone shaped net. And so when he collects zooplankton, he's not obviously going to count every single zooplankton that is in that huge net. He's actually counting from a much smaller subsample and then using math to um, expand that information to be representative of what would be in the entire net. And um, also we have information too then about once you've figured out how many zooplankton, you might want to figure out like which types of zooplankton make up a portion of the population. So you might have the cladosterans and the cyclopods, I think I'm saying that right. Um, 
And you might want to know how much of the population each represents at different times of the year, because that could tell you different things about how the biodiversity changes between summer and winter. So all this is in that exercise, um, and hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, if you have younger students who maybe aren't up to the math challenge, um, Marty Kitson has created a zooplankton density counter. So you have access to a spreadsheet, looks something like this, and you would just take the data and you would plug it in to this calculator in the right fields, and then it will do the math for you. So this is potentially um, a way you can work with the mathematical calculations for students who don't have that algebra or higher background. Um, we do have some other resources in the uh, Google Drive for you that are related specifically to this activity. Um, we have things that are like lake information, like just uh, stuff about the two inland lakes, the um, characteristics. Um, these were compiled by other authorities, so you can just link directly to them on the internet. We've got a bunch of different scientific research articles. Um, there is an article in there that was co-authored by Kirill, and many of them were uh, authored by folks at the um, Limnology Lab at the Natural Resources Research Institute. And then this Zoop Density Master, that's the spreadsheet that Marty Kitson created for calculating zooplankton density. And just a few other things that could be useful and getting you up to speed to discuss these things with your students or having the students read themselves. So that is all I have for you. Um, it is just a few moments before 10 o'clock. So is there anything else that you would like to cover, Marty, before we go to a break or Cindy? Well, I would just thank you very much, Cole. And remember, these are always works in progress. So if any of you start playing with this activity and, and you think it needs more explanation, anything different, let us know. I also just wanted to check and see, Karela, whether you are able to stick around for the small group uh, session. I don't uh, know if, we, did we ask her that? Oh, go ahead, Kirill. Uh Yeah, yeah, I can. I'm still here, yeah, I'm leaving after lunch. Okay, so, wonderful. No and then, um, Marty, do you have anything? I don't have anything to add at this point. All right, so as usual, we're starting back up at 10.03, because we never start back up at 10, and I wouldn't want to shake it up now. So 10.03, I'll put the break slide up, and we'll see you all in a few minutes. OK, it's 10.03. Are people there? I'm going to stop sharing the slide. And. Um, <laughs> I'm here, Cindy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I was just reading what Cole um, just typed into a private chat to me saying I can hear the pitter patter of little dog feet, which points out that I forgot to mute during the break. So my apologies. All right, let's see where we at. Um, so we are ready to start the uh, discussion session. And um, just the quick reminders that you usually get um, when you get into your session, please do a remember to accept the um, little button that says go to your session. Um, do a quick introduction and um, I encourage the facilitator to immediately pick a recorder or a reporter, I mean. Um, I think that works better than leaving it till the end. So if somebody who knows they're the reporter right up front and uh, hopefully you have a volunteer in your group. And then remember, and I think, um, Marty, could you put in the bit.ly uh, link, the bit.ly backslash 20 sturgeon. Ginny put it in a little bit ago. Um, it's up higher. I just didn't see it. Great. Um, so, and remember that uh, we will be spending until we're starting now. We'll be spending until at 1015, you'll get a five minute warning um, or shortly thereafter, 1019, um, one minute warning. And then we'll come back to just hear what people discussed. And that the topics are the same as they've been adapt for your grade level, adapt for a digital world and meet your standards and benchmarks. So I think I'm turning it over to Anne now. Is that right, Anne? Yeah, and I just wanted to let you know, um, some of the teachers have uh, left us. So the rooms are 
to the facilitators. Uh, the rooms are adjusted a little bit. Um, and Cole, you will have the middle school group. Um, and there are about uh, eight of you plus Kirill. So just want to let you know, things might look a little different than what I told you previously. So I'm going to go ahead and send you out to your room. So go ahead and accept the invitation. And we'll see you guys in a few minutes. Enjoy. Thank you. All right, looks like we got most people and I know a few have had to leave. Um, so I hope everything went really well in your small groups. And um, there was one thing I wanted to mention. Um, I was thinking about Cole's activity and I was thinking if you have a way to get kids on the water or out on the ice, I mean, or somewhere where they could actually collect some zooplankton, you could easily use Marty's zooplankton chart um, and a simple ID guide and do your own sorting. And you don't need a official zooplankton net because you can take a nylon and attach it to a ring and scoop your own. So at least it gives you a way to look and to see stuff and see what there is relative to different types of zooplankton. And I just wanted to throw that in there. So um, Kirill has something to say, I can tell. Yeah, yeah. and if you're in Duluth and you want to collect some zooplankton not so far from Duluth, I'm, I'm available too. You just ask me, I can probably help you with that. No problem. We have okay. equipment. <laughs> All right, so yeah, look at Marty's clapping. She loves that. So um, let's have report outs and we'll start today with elementary and I believe that was Jenny's group. And so I'm not sure who the reporter is. So I'll mute and let you talk. That'll be Zachary, thank you. All right. Um, it seemed like a big theme from our group was just the realization that we can go out and study our local ponds and water bodies all year long. Um, we talked about maybe making an art project and drawing pictures of what it would look like under the water, summertime versus wintertime, um, going out and maybe doing pictures on a picture post um, where you take a picture different times of the year from the same angle from the same spot. Um, and just really going out and exploring throughout every season. We also talked about some hands-on activities we could do with the younger students, um, maybe doing some type of activity with the chain of events with how um, the ice cover affects everything else in the water. Um, and then maybe making some type of model of the ice using man-made ice, maybe in a freezer. Um, showing what it would look like to the students if there was no snow and just clear water and then maybe putting snow or something else that would obstruct the view a little bit. So it's a lot of different hands-on activities we talked about. Cindy, you're muted. Does anybody from that group have something they want to add or another thought that came up as you were talking, Zachary? Thank you. I did think that you could even make your own little secchi disc, little transparency disc, and check the water or the light penetration in your own little homemade lake with ice and ice and snow. So, you know, there's a lot of fun things you can do like that. So thank you very much. And now we'll move to middle school, which was um, um, Cole and Kareel, and I'm not sure who's reporting for that one. I think we had um, yep, I'm reporting for that. Um, in our group, we, we talked about um, how we could adapt this to our grade level in using uh, Zoom sessions and introducing um, data collecting and how, how and why we are collecting the data, um, using modeling and graphing um, with the students. But there was concern, and I believe it was Cynthia, um, that teachers were, weren't getting enough support, you know, in the classroom so that it doesn't pile up on top of all the curriculum and, and everything we have to worry about. Um, so providing um, professional support to learn more about um, programs like Excel and some of the, the um, we could the students in the classroom. Um, so I, I think um, a lot of modeling would need to be used here to actually show the kids um, what to do with the data and how, how they can present their data and, and graph it and such. So um, th those were some of the things we talked about as far as adapting it to grade level and uh, online as well. 
Um, we talked about using online data, and David um, brought up um, that he uses real life data collected um, using a weather balloon so he can add and uh, give it a more real world application. Um, we talked about uh, also using a hydro lab uh, from the Limno program that uh, the kids could use data collected locally with. And then um, also they mentioned the Trident, uh, which is a uh, ROV, I believe, that could be rented and used for collecting data as well. So we could, as teachers, get out, collect the data um, from our parents and then back to the classroom and help the kids utilize that data with our uh, curriculum and activities. So um, we did have a question um, from David to Krill, and what the question was, what got him interested in science? And I, and he responded that it was one of his teachers. And I don't remember what, what teacher it was, Krill? Geography. Oh, yes, geography. Yeah. So um, that was interesting as well. Um, I think that was pretty much it for our group. Yeah, so sorry, I realized I was muted when I was chattering away. So let's move to the third group, even though I would love to hear Grill's answer, because we're right at that point of time again. So um, the third group is high school, and who is running that one? I forgot. Marty. No. Yeah, I, it, it, was, it was Marty's group. It was uh, Mick, Olivia, Michelle, Marty, and I, Nicole. Um, so we, um, we talked a lot about um, data and how data is beneficial to use in the classroom. You know, Olivia brought up that infusing the science and data into learning is really important in the local data so that we have that place-based learning is really valuable. Mick added that he thought that um, it's really meaningful for them to have their data, like for them to collect the data and for them to have that, that it feels more, it can feel more purposeful and meaningful for them. Um, and then we talked about the lesson and we really liked the lesson. We liked the layout. We liked, um, but most of all, and Michelle mentioned this and I thought it was a great point, that the collection, organization, sharing of the data is the most useful piece. A lot of us can build lessons around that, but having data sets that are really um, accessible for us to use to maybe with some guidelines and suggestions. Um, so um, some teachers do need, um, you know, uh, would like a more structured lesson or it's easier for them to use that with their administration or something but I think that sometimes just having the data sets curated a little bit for us is is um, very useful as well and that's what Michelle had mentioned so it was a good conversation great so unfortunately we are um, ready to well fortunately and unfortunately I'd like to hear more but um, we will be setting up to start wait a minute am I wrong in my timing girls 1025 no I'm not um, so we'll be setting up to start the joyful hour in a few minutes, but if you need to run away from the um, Zoom for a few minutes, that's fine. And I encourage you to stick around because it's going to be pretty interesting. We have professional development opportunities today, including um, one group talking about national opportunities, one group talking about traditional ecological knowledge, and one talking about watershed-based experiences. So um, we'll see you again at... Um, Let's say 11.03 is when we'll officially get off the ground on it, okay? Is that right, everybody? I'm looking at my notes here, hoping I'm not screwing up. Uh, Cindy, I think, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip that part okay. because uh, I'm gonna start packing everything. <laughs> and uh, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, such, a, such a nice opportunity. I hope it was uh, useful and enjoyable too. And uh, let me know if you have any questions, write me emails. If you, you will find my information, you can write me email if you have any questions about biology and what I've done, what was it, what was the information about. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was nice, so it was nice to present for you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Crow. We're on a quick little break. And um, we'll start up in Thank you, three, four minutes. Um, let's see. Yeah, so 
Um, we're heading off into the joyful hour and Anne can tell you how the groups are set up, but I can tell you that we have a few ideas of things you can talk about if things get a little slow. And that is, if, you're, if you've talked about those professional development opportunities, then think about what professional development opportunities you've been in before that have really mattered to you a lot and, uh, and why. So I, with just that, I think we will, I'll turn it over to Ann to get you set up to go to your groups. And thanks to Kelsey, um, John, and everyone else who is helping facilitate this one. Brian, I don't have all your names right in my, and John Weemholt, John Balada, Brian Henriksen, Kelsey Taylor, um, Michelle Hubert, and John Balada. So um, without further ado, remember the timing. You've got a bit of time in there. Um, and I'll have Anne, why don't you go over the times? Um, yeah, thanks, Cindy. So um, I'll be sending you to your rooms. Uh, a couple of you have picked your room, but otherwise you may be pleasantly surprised where you're put. Um, and just I'll send you a five minute warning at 1110 uh, um, and then send you out, send you back to me um, at 1115. Um, and just for John Bellotta, in case you haven't heard, you're also being joined in the room by Michelle Hubert. So she's going to talk about another national opportunity that she's been involved in. So you'll be sharing. Um, I'm not sure if you heard that already. I just want to let you know. Um, but yeah, and thank you to everyone for um, our facilitators for joining us today. So have a great and fruitful conversation. And Cindy wants to say one more thing. I forgot to mention um, the form. So remember, we have the uh, dragonfly form for someone to fill in. And that uh, some of our facilitators for these small groups don't know who all of you are. So, you know, take a minute to say, introduce yourselves. And I think that's it. So go for it, Anne.